On family care and aging will come to order. A quorum is present as soon as they sit down. Just saying. Uh, welcome back, committee. Uh, this is it's uh, uh, very fun to see all your faces here. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do today, so not a lot of talking, Senator Friends. Um, first, what I want to do is introduce. We have two new um, staff on our committee. We've got Brittany Johnson here to my left, who is our committee administrator. And then we've got Hannah Seitzinger, who is my CLA. So um, Larissa, who used to sit here, is now on our research team. Um, the first item on our agenda is Senate File 979, chief authored by Senator Kiff Meyer. This bill was heard last session in this committee and sent to general orders. It was returned to us under, under Senate Rule 47. So today we'll be voting to send the bill back to orders, general orders. Is there any discussion? That was easy. Hearing none, Senator Ralph moves Senate File 979 to be recommended to pass and place on general orders. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. The next item on the agenda, oh, Commissioner Malcolm. I was looking for Senator Nelson. No, we have you. Um, is Commissioner Malcolm on the Department of Health's work on assisted living licensure implementation, as well as the work that they have done in their health regulation division? Welcome, Commissioner Malcolm. Welcome back. Good morning, Madam Chair and, and members. It, it, is, it truly is very nice to see all of you. Thanks so much for the invitation to give you a progress report this morning on what we've been doing to implement uh, an, an extremely important piece of policy that you all supported last year, the Assisted Living Licensure Bill. But uh, to tell you um, what else is going on in that, that part of the department that is responsible for the regulation of health professionals and health facilities. Um, our mission, as you know, is to protect, maintain, and improve the health of all Minnesotans, and certainly our regulatory functions are an important part of how we do that. This committee doesn't really need a reminder of where we've been uh, over these last few years. We, you are well aware that with the growth in, in uh, the population of vulnerable adults in Minnesota, as well as the growth in numbers of facilities caring for those folks, we saw increasing numbers of reports coming into um, our, uh, the part of our, of our department that uh, investigates uh, reports from facilities and consumers, um, resulting in a growing backlog at the department. A lot of concerns raised about uh, the degree to which we were falling behind on the processing of those reports. It created lots of media attention, lots of legislative attention. A, a transition in the, in the commissioner role. Uh, in 2018, you probably remember, there was a very thorough um, Office of the Legislative Auditor report, as well as a series of policy recommendations made by uh, 
a really impressive coalition of consumer groups that Governor Dayton had asked to come together. The legislature and, and certainly this committee and Chair Housley spent a lot of time in 2018 debating policy changes, but there was a lot of debate but no bill at the end of the day. So then um, uh, I convened just informally, not at legislative or gubernatorial direction, a number of work groups to keep working on the issues. And I have said to you before, but I can't say it enough, just the extraordinary dedication of time and talent that all those consu the consumer groups and the provider groups, researchers, advocates, all came together to spend hundreds of hours uh, crafting a set of recommendations, which won uh, extraordinary bipartisan support last spring. Um, and we're just very, very grateful for that. What we've been doing since that time We've made lots of improvements and necessary improvements to kind of our base operations. Um, we have transitioned um, uh, some of the, the, the work of our federal, federally certified facilities and state only certified facilities had been handled differently in the department in the past and we've changed a lot of that. We've, uh, we've really worked hard to take the lessons that we learned from the continuous improvement projects that were done with the great help of the Department of Human Services in our Office of Health Facility Complaints and really tried to apply those learnings and those system improvements more broadly across our health regulatory functions. And I think it's a great story that I appreciate uh, Chair Housley's invitation to share with you because I think that's what we should do when we learn painful lessons um, in one part of our operations to try to apply that more broadly. So we've really made just an awful lot of uh, process improvements within what you know as the Office of Health Facility Complaints, but more broadly across all the parts of that division that touch um, anything to do with the certification, licensing, and inspection of care facilities. Um, and, and that's really um, get, set us up for a really major modernization effort across all of these regulatory functions. Throughout that time, we've worked hard, um, as have the stakeholders, to continue to keep up that really collaborative, really open dialogue. Uh, we know that you know, we together have passed a really significant uh, policy improvement and change that will affect a, a great uh, a, a a great number of providers across the state as well as consumers, and we need to do that well. We know we're going to learn as we implement and be back uh, before you, I'm sure, in, in future years with uh, improvements to that structure. So keeping that dialogue going and having the stakeholders very involved in the implementation process, I think will serve um, us all well. Um, you in, I think you have a number of handouts in your packet. Uh, this is this chart here is is just looking at the Office of Health Facility Complaints, so a subset of the Health Regulation Division. But this was the unit that was under such scrutiny from the media and from policymakers. This is where formerly all of the uh, complaints, as we as we had just uh, been talking about them, because that's the title of the function, the Office of Health Facility Complaints, even though. In truth, the number of reports coming into that office were not all literally complaints. Um, a large number of the, of the reports actually are self-reports from facilities who report into us uh, when anything um, that they're aware of has happened or may have happened that might fit the state's definitions of, um, of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. So the important thing on this chart uh, is it really is the, uh, the the steady decline in from 2017 to the end of 2019 in the average number of days to close investigations. So that subset of the reports that come in uh, that actually get an on-site um, investigation of the report. Um, we've made significant progress in even though the volume has uh, has gone up. We are. Uh, we're, we're pursuing more of those reports and doing it more quickly. This, again, is the average number of days to close. Some of the uh, reports are, are quite complex uh, and take a long time to investigate. Others are much more quickly uh, resolved than this. But um, steady progress there, more to go. Um, and uh, also in your report, I think, is the year-end dashboard. One of the things that we did to increase um, our accountability to you and the public was to uh, continually keep posted on our website the statistics of what's happening with this report investigation function. 
you can see from this chart. Um, and again, these are, these are the reports that have to do with enforcement of the state's Vulnerable Adults Act. So it's all about the definitions in that act of what constitutes abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation, as well as other uh, <laughs> compliance issues that are not about maltreatment. Um, so what you can see in this year-end report is that the volume of reports has, has, um, has, has, has pretty much stabilized at around the uh, uh, 1,600 uh, report per month mark. Um, you see another thing that we've done um, is to show what percentage or what number of, these, uh, of, vo of this volume is coming from the self-reports from the facilities, the nursing homes, home care providers, hospitals, or others that are required to report versus the, and that's in the green on your chart, versus the, um, the reports that are being submitted by consumers or people on behalf of consumers. So those are really the, the, the um, uh, that's an important distinction since a lot of the facility self-reports um, actually are cured by the facility uh, before we ever get out there to investigate uh, and potentially use any regulatory sanctions. Um, you can also see on this chart what are the, what are, what's the breakdown of the types of allegations. Um, and, and you can see that um, there is a, a when it comes to individual consumer reports, you see more reports about ho the home care part of the of the business than about the the residential part of the nursing home. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the, and the uh, report totals by allegation type, you can see that neglect remains the most frequent uh, by a pretty good margin of the of the report types. The next few slides are just for your reference, but I think it's it's helpful uh, to remember what is the definition of abuse, uh, what is the definition of maltreatment. There, it, it's broken down to abuse and neglect and financial exploitation under the Act, and those terms all have uh, statutory meaning, which is a big part of what we do during the intake process, is to and then in the subsequent investigation, if investigation is warranted, to see whether the particular incident that's being reported, either by the facility or the consumer, meets these uh, these uh, statutory terms or not. Um, and that's uh, that's an important distinction because oftentimes uh, reports that come in about concerns, um, there's a real there's a real issue there, but it is not it's not subject to the jurisdiction of the department under the Vulnerable Adults Act. So just an important piece of of uh, context to remember. I'm going really quickly uh, here, and we can certainly come back to any questions that you might have. So the funding that the legislature granted in 2019. Uh, was a very significant uh, budget ask, and we are so grateful for your support um, and, and the support in the House as well to fund not only the costs of standing up the new assisted living licensure system, but to, but to really stabilize the base operations on which that licensure system needs to be built. Um, the budget that we requested and you supported um, also helped us to stabilize that core operation in a very important way. Um, part of what had gotten us uh, kind of behind the eight ball, so to speak, with the old system was that it was all paper-based. There was really uh, very poor use of technology in terms of tracking and managing the caseloads, uh, inability to really quickly pull information out of the system that would let us know what's the status of an individual report, what are the workloads, how are we doing. So uh, a big part of the ask was not only to build staff capacity, but to fix some of those um, business operations and automation of what, what we could do. And very importantly, to be able to make better use of, the, of all the information flowing through this function. So one of the things, and the legislative auditor commented about this extensively as well, just the antiquated nature of the, the, of the, the lack of electronic um, capacity to, uh, to track and integrate information. So part of our budget ask last year was to build a case management framework, which is, which is not the same as saying we're going to build a new information system de novo or buy a big information system off the shelf. Our proposal was to uh, build a framework that would help us to integrate 
pieces of, uh, of an information solution, some of which we already have and some of which need to be built, but they need to be connected and able to, to speak to each other. Um, and so that uh, those, as you can see on this chart here, what the funding was for that case management work uh, and the fact that we uh, have, uh, we're, we're well begun on the project, but it will take a few years before the in an integrated case management system is fully in place. But uh, we very soon will have uh, the common online entry point for providers to use for submitting abuse reports that can connect right into MARC rather than being a, uh, a separate and, and more inefficient system. Uh, we also will, uh, we're just kicking off uh, the building of a public data reporting website so that pr consumers will be able to uh, search the database for better information uh, to guide their decisions in selection of providers. A really important thing that we asked, it wasn't a very um, flashy part of the ask, but critical, was for, to, f to appropriately fund the state match for the Medicaid funding that is so important to um, enforcing uh, all of these activities with federally certified providers. So that, that $3 million um, uh, request um, helped us not only to um, add our staff positions, but to leverage that, uh, that federal Medicaid funding as well, as well as to add an entire additional survey team to help us be more timely on the home care and assisted living uh, report investigations while we still have this bifurcated um, uh, home care and assisted living uh, structure. So we've, uh, we've been able to increase a significant amount of staffing. It's a lot of work, as you can imagine, to, uh, to, uh, to bring on uh, that many new positions. But thanks to your support, um, we're, we're in good shape there. I'm really excited about the investments that you supported in data and analysis and engagement. How can I think you, uh, many of you said during these couple, last couple of years that we've been working together on this, um, we need to be smarter about understanding what's really driving these, these reports and these issues to begin with and how can we do a better job of working upstream with the providers and with consumers to identify process improvement opportunities, care improvement opportunities that would help us to, um, to move the whole system toward more of a continuous improvement model. Uh, and that work is well under, underway to build a more kind of analytically driven uh, function, uh, m many more performance metrics to, to help us not only make the work more efficient, but very critically to work with the provider community who is eager to work with us on upstream um, quality improvement activities. So I mentioned that we are really taking to heart the lessons that we learned through how we got into the problems that we developed uh, within the Office of Health Facility Complaints. Um, but also taking a look at whether some of those same issues might exist in other components of the regulatory function. What, uh, the Health Regulation Division is one of the most complicated parts of the Health Department. It's one of the largest divisions, um, um, over 250 employees in that division, uh, built around seven different programs that were all created by the legislature at one time or another over the course of decades, um, separate programs to license, to, um, to oversee uh, different types of providers or different types of provider settings, but they were all really built in their own little silos as kind of standalone programs for, um, uh, for dealing with one or another uh, provider type or facility type. Um, and so what, what we've been doing is to try to understand more deeply the nature of the work in all of those programs and to notice that even though they were set up as separate programs, they had a, a lot of the same functions in them. So the, the redesign that we're doing right now is aimed at um, really taking a very, very different look at how to organize so that we don't create redundancy or lack of connectivity between the information that can flow between those functions. We think that's going to give us not only a much more efficient operation, but one that's more nimble and more able to respond to, uh, to policy direction from the legislature and as the field continues to evolve. Um, that legislative auditor report, as I know many of you uh, remember and spent a lot of time looking at that report as a great diagnostic of what had, had gone wrong, 
spoke a lot about management systems, culture, morale, um, again, things that, that in this redesign effort uh, we uh, are really driving uh, a lot of what we're doing. So uh, this next, uh, the next picture is just sort of a, it's a, a, a picture of the functional redesign of the health regulation division, which is not now built around um, se separate sites of care, nursing homes versus home care versus housing with services, but no, and not built separately around state certified versus federally certified facilities, but around what's the nature of the work. So having an intake process that's very, very good that does the intake of reports no matter what type of, of facility it is, um, for an example. Um, another thing that, that uh, we're, we're really gonna focus on is, is a much more regional structure. So we're, we're less St. Paul struck St. Paul centric in terms of some of the uh, some of the uh, investigatory functions, but really putting that work closer to uh, the facilities and the consumers that are served, as well as creating um, a rapid response team that can respond quickly to uh, very complex investigations. Occasionally we have a really complicated situation and, or a really um, dramatic situation that requires really fast action to protect um, uh, vulnerable adults. And uh, if, if, that, if that kind of action is done by the same team that is doing sort of the routine licensing and certification and report investigation work it, in, in a, a complicated situation or an urgent situation then ties up a lot of those folks uh, and then the backlog of the routine work just, just piles up. So we know, we don't know where, we don't know exactly what, but we know these happen with some regularity. So having a, a really expertly trained team who's able to deal with some of those complex situations and can be deployed to work on that uh, particular um, um, situation without disrupting the regular flow, um, I think was a, a, a really smart enhancement suggested by the staff themselves. So this new structure is really gonna better fit the reality of the work, not just be you know, designed around a statute because the statute was speaking to, to only one type of provider 20 years ago, uh, but, uh, but re really matches what the actual work is. Uh, there be much clearer staff roles and responsibilities, much better ability to allocate the staff where, uh, where the need is, um, much more consistency, much more standardization of processes and um, appropriate training, as, as well as supervision and auditing of the functions. Um, the regionalization, we think, is also gonna help cut down on um, on, uh, on travel time for the investigators and the, and the certifiers who are uh, going out to these facilities, um, helping them to, do, to spend more of the time doing the work and less time driving, as well as being, I think, a, a, a benefit for the staff themselves in terms of uh, quality of work-life balance. So we're really excited about this redesign. It's, um, I, I appreciate your indulgence and your time to listen to something that's so, so much inside baseball, but I, we wanted to share it with you because I think it's, um, it, it's um, I'm really proud of the work that the team has done to really dig deep and apply some hard learned lessons uh, in a broader way. So now to shift um, to uh, how we're doing on implementing the assisted living licensure um, system. As you recall, um, the, we will be fully transitioned to a system where anyone who is marketing themselves, calling themselves an assisted living facility needs to be licensed as such by August 1st of 2021. So we, we have, but it's a fast timeline. That, uh, that was one of the negotiated pieces with all the stakeholders was how quickly could we get this done in a reasonable way uh, because that's really the, the, the licensure system and process itself is really the, the major uh, consumer protection, enhancement of consumer protection is the new regulatory structure. So that uh, getting that in place um, as quickly as possible was very important to the whole agreement coming together. And as you recall, <coughs> under, uh, under the new licensure system, there will now be one single contract that, uh, that a resident consumer um, has for both the housing and the services within that housing if they're in an assisted living facility. 
uh, new physical plant and fire safety requirements, an enhanced bill of rights, uh, licensure process for the directors of the assisted living facilities, um, um, clearer facility responsibilities and requirements, uh, the survey and investigation regime, and uh, consumer protections tied to the licensure structure. Um, so all of that being put in place by August 1st of 2021. Some things are already in place. Uh, some of the consumer protections that were designed to go into place last summer uh, have been accomplished. Um, uh, an, an, an assisted living bill of rights, the ability, not the requirement, but the permission for the department to apply immediate fines in the case of very severe violations, uh, serious violations of, of state law. Um, a maltreatment compensation fund for uh, consumers experiencing um, uh, um, validated or substantiated allegations of maltreatment um, prior to the uh, to the licensure law being in uh, effect. Uh, prioritization of the department's investigation work to make sure that we are dealing with uh, termination of services or termination of housing um, very quickly and implementation of the electronic monitoring uh, section of, uh, of uh, the bill. Um, stakeholder engagement activities have continued. Uh, we've got it's a, a complex piece of legislation to implement and we've been having teams across not only the health department but DHS and the ombudsman working together to implement uh, this law. Uh, a lot of hiring uh, and a lot of mapping of the workflows and process requirements. So um, a lot, lot of sort of back office uh, uh, preparation work has been going on since last summer. Uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, as I mentioned, um, was uh, strengthened, uh, the, the Home Care Bill of Rights, and those changes were effective uh, August 1st of last year. Uh, and MDH is now enforcing uh, compliance with those enhanced <laughs> rights um, and will do so not only through the report uh, or the investigation process when a complaint or a report is filed, but also through our periodic uh, home care surveys. And uh, all consumers are now getting uh, the new information in writing. Um, electronic monitoring um, went into effect uh, January 1st. We uh, worked very closely with the Office of the Ombudsman for Long-Term Care to prepare for that. We developed the consent forms for residents and their representatives uh, to conduct monitoring in the living quarters. Uh, and that, uh, so that those materials are on site. We've uh, created information to explain how the new law works uh, on our website. And I, uh, as far as, as uh, I understand, and you could certainly ask the ombudsman for some on the ground perspective on this as well, but the implementation has gone quite well and we've not seen, uh, we've not seen a lot of, uh, of issues or, or complaints at all um, from either facilities or consumers related to the electronic monitoring law. So uh, even though the bill itself was uh, um, unusually detailed and contained a lot of uh, uh, specificity in it, um, there still is the need for rulemaking uh, on a very, very accelerated timetable. Um, so we've got 13 areas of the bill that were identified for needed rulemaking, and we've been meeting monthly with the stakeholder group. Um, we're well underway in drafting that rule. Um, and deploying staff from other parts of the department to help with a really rapid and, and uh, complicated rulemaking project. Um, the timeline requires us to adopt this rule by December 31st of this year so that providers have got the time to, you know, to, to plan for uh, and implement the changes that they need to make for those that wish to be licensed by next August. So this is, we're on a really rapid time frame, which is really, again, requiring lots of time and help from the stakeholders. Um, we will, of course, have a public uh, hearing process. We anticipate, just given the, the, the nature of the rules, the interest in this subject, that there will be a public hearing and probably comments and revisions, all of which need to happen on a really fast timetable in order for us to meet that uh, December 31st deadline. Um, so what we've also been doing as we're working with the stakeholders is identifying um, things that need to be fixed about the law. 
not only things that need to be addressed in the rule, but where do we have some technical, uh, some technical issues or some problems that as we have had more time to spend with the language. So what we're doing right now is, tr is coming up with a really, really, really prioritized list of the things that we think need to be fixed this year. Uh, and we'll get that, uh, that list and that language to you immediately knowing what, uh, what a tight timeline you are under. Um, and, and we all know that uh, we're going to discover more issues as we implement the law, and I'm sure be back in future sessions with additional uh, suggestions for refinements to the law based on experience. But these are the things that uh, we, we think need to be fixed even to implement the law by August of 21. And again, it's going to, I hope, be a, a nice, tight, short list. Um, and I do have uh, some of the uh, staff here who are doing this hard work. They deserve all the credit, not me. Uh, but they are also here to answer uh, detailed questions that you may have, Madam Chair. But that concludes my, uh, my overview. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. I want to say um, congratulations on the redesign of HRD. Uh, I know it was a, a ton of work, and the new structure seems to make so much more sense, but it was a big lift for you and your staff, and I know you're still continuing to navigate that and uh, with Michelle Larson. Um, it's, it's impressive. I wish we could do that in a bunch of other departments, but we'll focus on our committee. <laughs> um, so, so did you, you had to hire consultants to facilitate the uh, rulemaking. Um, what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, actually, we're, um, the consultants have been more working with us on uh, process uh, redesign, business process redesign and, and employee engagement in, the, in the, the structural redesign of the health regulation division uh, within which OHFC and the licensing and certification, et cetera, fit. Um, the, we're, we're just, re, when I mentioned about the rulemaking, adding, uh, just pulling additional rule writing resources from other areas of the department to help us just with the volume of the rule drafting process. So um, it, not external consultants for the rule writing, but, uh, but, but internal staff reallocations. Oh, okay, so, uh, I get it. Um, when, when will you have the uh, rules available for public comment? Do you uh, the first draft, uh, I'll just ask somebody to come to the table, whoever wants to come up and can help me with the rule timeline. Yeah, yeah, the rulemaking timeline would help us. Hello, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Marie Dotseth. I'm an assistant commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Health, and we anticipate having uh, rules for comment in April. April. Thank you, Ms. Dotseth. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and just on the same topic, and I just welcome back, and here we are again, and what a difference two years can make, and uh, I think this is a testimony to a successful bicameral, bipartisan, by whatever um, process that you know, listening to everybody. Um, and so on the rulemaking, they're going to come out in April. Um, is I haven't been to any meetings. I haven't watched anything. So I just know what random things people tell me. Uh, it, it took a while to get to a consensus on the topics that we were going to pass uh, two years. Um, is it pretty well agreed by everybody what the rules should say, just not how they're written yet? Or are we still hammering out what the rules are supposed to say. Um, Ms. Dotseth, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Abler. So, uh, so it's agreed kind of the topic areas. Um, some of those topic areas are controversial. Um, there's, an, there's a handout here, I think, that you have. Um, the, the implementation update has some specifics about what's included in the rules and the timeline for that. So there is um, a I think there are some more challenging issues within uh, the rulemaking. The details will be challenging, but we're working through them. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Well, that actually wasn't the answer I was hoping for. Oh. Um, yeah, we're just about there. We're just working on syntax. And so um, that's, if I could just, <laughs> it's really important this is as close to a consensus as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's unfortunate that there's these hard deadlines that we have to meet in order to hit the next deadline. So that means at some point, whoever's writing these rules is going to write something down that, that you like. 
because uh, you're writing them, uh, you being the, the department and whatever it's, and, and it's going to be like it or lump it. And I, I hope that this, that the collegial thing can be continued where there's not just two sides, there's like 10 sides here. And um, so I'm just encouraging you about that. And I just, and I, then as to the cost, um, is the cost that's going to be assessed back to the various facilities a function of what it's costing to build all these rules, or is that already set? What each place has to pay? Commissioner Malcolm. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Senator Abler, and um, invite Ms. Dotz has to, to comment on this too. The, the, the fees actually were set in the statute, I believe, right? Um, yes. Uh, in, the, in the bill itself, set the, the, uh, the general and per bed fee for both uh, the, the basic assisted living, li we don't call it basic, but the assisted living license and assisted living with dementia care license. So that fee structure um, was, was set in the statute. All right. Well, well thanks. And I've, I thought that was maybe so, but I'm just glad to hear that. And I, it's, it's actually too bad that some people, some places that have been stellar are going to be dinged for the behavior of people who weren't stellar. But it's really important going forward, so I'm still a fan. Thanks for all your work. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Abler. Senator Coran? Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Commissioner Malcolm. Um, I've heard some good things here today, and, uh, but to follow up on Senator Abler's question, on the, on the fees, when, when we talk about the fees, the easy ones to calculate are the ones that we dictate by statute, right? The license fees, whatever those are. And we've heard a lot of talk about bringing in the stakeholders, and you know where I stand. Stakeholders are wonderful, and they should all be included. Um, but I also, again, want you out there doing the job. I want you to live by the rules that you create. I want your staff to do that, because then I think your uh, rulemaking process or your decision-making process will change greatly. And I know some, you know, you've got staff who've come from the industry. We need more um, people who've come from the industry to actually do it. But the, the transparent fees are the ones that we know about. The ones that I'm concerned about are the rest of the, uh, uh, the update you've given us in um, facilities, physical plant requirements, the, the things that um, are different or what is different? I'd like to see what's different between the state building codes and those things that are in place today versus what you would, are planning to propose, because those are all the real costs. And then in addition to that, all of the reporting requirements and everything, I, I want from the stakeholders, and I, want, I would like it to see it reported that, what is the total cost? Because what you're talking about is every hour that we add to their time, where they're doing, where it's non-revenue generating, non-care providing, is a disservice to the people that are in those facilities. And, and I want to know, what are those? What, are the, what, what will be the um, impact on our stakeholders? Um, and I'd like those material figures provided so we can understand the impact, because it's going to increase the cost dramatically, depending on what the rules look like and all of the reporting. And again, I want effective reporting. I want to minimize the time that the agencies have to provide the actual care providers in what they have to do um, and make sure that it's truly focused. Um, and with that, so there's a few topics buried in there, but with that, um, to the investigative side, and I don't see it in the report, um, on the, on the, the uh, complaint side, it looks like it's, it's nice, it's broken down by facilities report, individual reports, but I didn't see um, those, based on facilities and the individual reports, those that truly were material as far as the investigation side, kind of those that were, those that were um, substantiated, I didn't see that in there, so I'd like to see that at some point in the future broken down. Commissioner Malcolm. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Cran, thank you. And, and first, I think we very much agree with your, your overarching principle that we need to have the, the regulatory process be as effective and efficient as possible so that um, the regulatory activities are ha actually helping to drive quality improvement and not just, not just extra, extra work that's irrelevant to the care. So your, your points are, are always well taken there. I believe on the actual full dashboard itself, uh, which is a handout in your in your packet. You can see, um, but actually, I, perhaps you're asking for it to be broken down by facility type. Correct. Uh, which which of the reports were substantiated yeah. and unsubstantiated? Manager. 
Senator Cran. Yes, Commissioner Malcolm. And I see that there is investigative findings, but it appears that it's broken down between the two offices, the reporting mechanisms, and not based on facilities versus individuals. Um, because again, if facilities are, are bombarding us with just self-reporting and you know, ultimately um, results in 20% or 10% or whatever that number is, uh, certainly would like to see that be included from a reform perspective on the need to report and self-report. What's it taken and is it actually effective? So. Madam Chair, uh, Senator uh, Curran, that's a, a good suggestion and we'll, we'll seek to break out that level of detail. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ralph. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Malcolm, I note in the VVA, or VAA reports, we talk about 2019 and the total reports of 21,000, and you had indicated that there seemed to be a stabilization in the number of monthly reports. How does this 2019 total compare with prior years in terms of the actual uh, reports or, or uh, uh, claims of abuse or, or neglect? Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Ralph, it's, it's, a, it's a, a significant increase. Um, I don't have off the top of my head what the numbers were back to like 2016 or so when we really started to see uh, a, a rapid rise in the number of reports due both to the implementation of MARC and, as we mentioned, just the growth of, of uh, the population and the, and the facilities themselves. But um, I'm not sure if anyone has a better memory than I about the size of the, of the, of the increase. Oh, from where? Ms. Datseth. Excuse me. Oh. Um, it, I, I don't know the size of the increase. I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair. It's been about 20,000 for the past three years, 20, 21, 22,000 for the past three years has been the number. But report uh, increased from, I don't have that. Senator Ralph. Um, the other question I guess I have is about the marks and how that is working out. Um, many of the complaints that we received were that it was uncertain that this was the only supposed to be the only data entry point that, that, that the stuff was to get into the system. Has that been achieved now so that we're, there's, we can safely say to people, no, you go to this one site and this is where you report and that, that, that it will be handled from there or are we still getting inputs from other, from other sources? Madam Commissioner Chair, Malcolm. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Ralph, great question. Um, we, and we can... Have, we can ask that question of the folks who run the MARC system and try to get back to you on, uh, on, a, on a good answer to that question. I would, I would just be speculating. I think um, w we have done a good job collectively of getting that word out there that the reporting system is the, is the best way to get, to get things into the system most promptly. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that there, still, there, that there still are some, some number of reports coming from other directions, but I can't quantify that for you. But we, we certainly can check into that and get back to you. Just one, just one follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the other thing that was troubling, and I'm hoping that the case management system will help this, but at the level of marks, when the information came in, it apparently, as I understood it from the previous testimony, there was really no attempt to triage at that highest or at that first level. Now, has that changed to, uh, to increase the efficiency of the system? In other words, the capability of saying, oh, we are either we already know about this or this is something we can handle summarily, uh, or is it still kind of just an input portal and then we're kind of trying to figure out what happens after that? Commissioner Malcolm. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Ralph, um, I, I would ask to be corrected if I'm wrong about this, but I don't think there's any triaging done at the level of the, of the mark intake. It's just that they get the mark sorts and, and gets, the, gets the information uh, to either the counties or to MDH um, as quickly as they can. So I guess that's a level of triage. But in terms of the severity of the, of the report itself, we've, that's one of the things we've really improved is a, is a triage assessment with, when it comes to us, when it gets into MDH, um, we get eyes on the vast majority of the reports uh, really quickly so that the most, um, the, the reports that, that show the, the greatest potential for, uh, for harm to, uh, to, re to consumers or residents are prioritized much, much more quickly. And we didn't really used to do that. It was just kind of what came in, came in and, 
we got to it when we got to it. Uh, but the triage system itself has been significantly improved. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, thank you. That was one of the very big issues that I had heard that there was a where there was a very serious allegation of, of harm or abuse or neglect, that, that there was a delay in actually getting that to the appropriate authority to investigate quickly. So if the system is now starting to, to be more responsive, and I guess that's what I meant by triage rather than ultimately assigning the case, was how quickly and how we are assessing a particular claim as it comes in. Because I think that was one of the great complaints that at least I received was that the consumers didn't feel that they were being responded to appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Senator thank you for the work that you're doing. I, it's, a, it's a heavy lift, and I appreciate the work you're doing on it. Um, along that same lines, I just to clarify what Senator Ralph was saying is both the the public and the facility supposed to be reporting to Mark, and is it um, not just maltreatment but licensing val uh, uh, violations also? Madam Ms. Chair. Dotsa. Um, so one of the, uh, in the in the budget update, um, Commissioner Malcolm showed you kind of that single entry point update, which is what we're trying to do. So there's a, the facilities report in through the NHIR uh, system. So we're going to try, though, the single landing page is the idea where you have one place to report. If you're a provider, it'll direct you over to the appropriate place for the uh, provider reports to go, but so that then we can collect them all as one. So that's a system improvement that's in play, that is underway right now. It's one of those projects that was funded last session. And uh, back still on Mark, um, what, is, what is MDH doing with your appropriation um, that you got from Mark and what is DHS doing with theirs, do you know? Yes, Madam Ms. Chair. Um, there is a, that is, was another block in that chart, and there is a project plan, and we can provide you as much detail as you want, and we are working jointly with DHS on that project plan and um, have that completion date out there for you um, that we, so, so we can show you in detail what we're doing with that improvement there. Thank you. Members, any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for coming, and... and Keep on keeping on the good work. Thank you. Thank you. We are changing up the order. Um, since Senator Nelson is here, we are going to hear her bill. The next bill on the agenda is Senate File 3017, chief authored by Senator Nelson. Madam Chair, I'll move the bill. Senator Abler moves the bill. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is great to be with the Family Care and Aging Committee, and uh, I'm pleased to present Senate File 3017. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the co-chairs, the co-authors, I should say, Madam Chair, the co-authors. That would be uh, Senator Abler, Klein, Eakin, and Senator Curran. Um, thank you, Senator Nelson. Do you have an amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I do. I have the uh, A1 amendment. Madam Chair, I'll move the A1. Senator Abler moves the A1 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an author's amendment to get the bill in the shape uh, that I would like, and I will address this amendment uh, as I briefly discuss the bill. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a little bit of background on uh, Senate File 3017. Uh, some of you will recall that in 2017, the legislature established the uh, caregiver grants to support family caregivers of vulnerable Minnesotans. And the statute language uh, said that starting in July 1 of 2019, the Board of Aging will administer uh, those uh, caregiver grants. And this bill makes a small change to the existing statute to ensure that these funds are made available to caregivers and vulnerable Minnesotans. Um, it requires that the Board on Aging work with area agencies on aging and caregiver stakeholders in administering the grants. This will make the grants more efficient and more effective and more accessible to the communities to which they were intended to serve. By working with the area agencies on aging, 
the board will be able to dispense the grants to the family caregivers more directly than the board itself uh, doing that. Um, and it will be with less delay because the area agencies on aging have established relationships with county officials that work with this population. I imagine many of you have worked with your county um, agency on aging. It's incredibly helpful. I know that they have uh, helped my family as we um, walked that long path of uh, long goodbyes with Alzheimer's. And I know, uh, Madam Chair, you have also uh, done that as well. And uh, the area agencies on aging can be extremely helpful. Um, so this uh, legislation is a very simple change. It makes those grants uh, um, to be worked through with the area agencies on aging where they'll get closer to uh, their intended targets quicker. Um, also the amendment members um, adds a reporting requirement. Uh, and again, uh, this is important as well. And you will note that uh, it changes the date so that there's time for some results to come back. And that was a, a, a request by the Board on Aging. And finally, members, the third thing that this bill does is it um, allows all family caregivers of older adults to apply for these grants uh, because it removes the language that was setting a priority uh, for access to consumers who were referred through the uh, senior linkage line. So that was a, a portion of the bill that was stricken. Uh, and, and members, I know that many of us, um, as I said, have, have walked this path. Unfortunately, we know that there are more and more Minnesotans who uh, are facing challenges in, in aging, particularly from Alzheimer's. I think we have about 96,000 Minnesotans now who uh, have Alzheimer's, and we know by 2030 we'll have over a million, 1.3 uh, million Minnesotans with Alzheimer's, about one in four of those over age 65. So it's important that we make sure our resources are placed in a way that can best reach their intended target to help those very important family caregivers. With that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn uh, uh, the um, testimony over to Mary Margaret Lehman, if, if she's on your agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Les Nelson. Ms. Lehman. Good morning. I am a wife. I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm an aunt, I'm a sister and a friend. I was a speech therapist and an adjunct professor, but when one of Ken's seven doctors, while he was trying to, while we were trying to get a diagnosis, said to me, well, I think it could be Alzheimer's, let's just wait and see. But if it is Alzheimer's, he went on to say, you be sure that you make, give him an active life. Find good activities for him. Make sure he lives a full life, a life full of purpose. Take good care of him. I was frozen. I was paralyzed with the thought of this new role. Whatever would this mean? for our lives, for my life. But when Ken was finally diagnosed 10 years ago, after 14 years of trying to get a diagnosis, his neurologist added, well, in order to slow the progression of the disease, it's important that he have a Mediterranean or a mind diet, that he has plenty of socialization, that he has exercise, that he learns something new, that he has at least eight hours of sleep at night, and that you try to abate the stress in his life for at least 10 minutes a day. We chose to go get an ice cream cone or drive a, take a drive around a lake in order to, to abate any kind of stress right here in Minnesota. So with all of these lifestyle changes and trying to adjust to a new life, a friend from California called to see how I was doing. Not well, I remember saying. I am overwhelmed. I just don't even know where to begin. She said, 
called the Alzheimer's Association. My father had Alzheimer's, and they were a tremendous help to us. So I called the Alzheimer's helpline, which I now refer to as my lifeline. And the care consultant I connected with became my best friend. Now she guided me, taught me the importance of taking care of myself first before I could ever begin to take care of my husband. I learned I couldn't care for his needs when I didn't have care for myself. I learned if my cup is empty, I have nothing to share. Caregiving is a huge, arduous undertaking. We need so much courage. We become so emotional. We are strong, and yet we're so fragile. We act so brave, and yet we're so frightened. We are so vulnerable. The list goes on and on. Maria Shriver, on her HBO documentary, The Alzheimer's Project, states that 74% of family caregivers do not outlive their loved ones. On behalf of all caregivers in Minnesota, we thank Senator Nelson and Chair Housley for the support of respite care. It's an incredible gift. It says, in essence, we care about you, too. We are thinking of you, and you are not alone. It gives us hope. And hope right now is all we have toward ending this disease of Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lehman. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Josh Nye, and I'm the manager of state affairs for the Alzheimer's Association, Minnesota, North Dakota chapter. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, to respect your time, I will speak to both SF 3017 and, and uh, Chair Housley's SF 3033, which you will hear later. Uh, and I want to say uh, thank you to Senator Nelson and Chair Housley for introducing these bills to help family caregivers. Uh, there are 97,000 Minnesotans living with Alzheimer's. We estimate this number will reach 120,000 by 2025, an increase of nearly 24%. In Minnesota, there are 255,000 family caregivers of people with Alzheimer's, providing 291 million hours of unpaid care at a value of over $3.6 billion per year. Almost 78% of these people manage household care, including cleaning and cooking, and nearly 48% manage personal care, like feeding or bathing. More than half, half of all adults providing unpaid care to people living with dementia have been doing so for at least two years. One in four provide 20 hours or more of care per week, and one in four are the sandwich generation, caring for both someone with dementia and another person who's usually a child. 14% have reported frequent poor mental or physical health, and nearly 30% have a history of depression. Respite services provide temporary substitute care that gives the caretaker a break. This temporary relief ensures the person living with dementia receives quality care while their caregiver manages and improves their own health. SF 3017 makes small changes to an existing grant program that will get funding assistance to caregivers directly and efficiently. And SF 3033 adds respite care to the list of covered services for people who don't qualify for Medicaid but still need assistance to remain in their own homes. Both bills bring positive change that will help family caregivers find time to care for themselves. But we recognize more must be done to support the growing number of people with Alzheimer's and their caregivers and look forward to working with the committee on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? No questions, Senator Nelson. Uh, Ms. Lehman, thank you so much for your story and, and what you do for your spouse. It's you. tough work, as Senator Nelson and many of us here at the table know. So take care of yourself. Um, Senator Nelson, is there, do you know if there's a fiscal impact to this bill? Thank you, Madam Chair, for asking. No, there's not. Uh, my understanding 
uh, was that it would uh, go to the floor uh, if, that is, if, if that is your desire. Uh, but there's not a fiscal note. Thank you very much, Senator Nelson. Uh, having no questions, Senator Ralph moves Senate file 3017 as amended, be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. <laughs> Off to the floor, Senator Thank Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, now back to the Alzheimer's Disease Working Group presentation. Good morning, Madam Chair, and Thank you. members of the committee. I'm Darrell Foss, and it was my honor to serve as the chair for the Alzheimer's Disease Working Group. Our focus for this group was to identify actions necessary to address the needs of almost 100,000 Minnesotans living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and to prepare the state for an even larger wave of Minnesotans who will be impacted by dementia in the coming years. Each recommendation we have included plays an integral part in changing the future of so many Minnesotans. Your actions will have a powerful impact on the lives of thousands of people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, while ultimately reducing the cost of these diseases to our state. It is a goal worthy of your efforts. I was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment in June of 2015. Since that time, I have been actively involved in dementia advocacy and a number of research projects conducted by organizations across Minnesota. With some accommodations, I am living well with the disease. Other Minnesotans with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias don't have as positive a story to share. Minnesota can and must do more to change their life stories. We are extremely proud of the work that we have done in repairing this report. For 10 months, over 75 Minnesotans were involved on the working group and its five supporting committees to update the 2011 report, Preparing Minnesota for Alzheimer's, the budgetary, social, and personal impacts. Whether our perspective was as a care partner, caregiver, researcher, clinician, professional care provider, or a person living with the disease, we came together and shared our stories, expert knowledge, and hopes. The working group tackled the challenge of distilling all that was discussed into the most important and specific actions the state can take to respond to the full impact of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. The next important steps are up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foss. Ms. Hennen, I think you're next. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Cheryl Hennen, State Long-Term Care Ombudsman for the Office of Ombudsman of Long-Term Care. We are a program of the Minnesota Board on Aging, and I want to publicly thank Mr. Foss for his service as chair of this very important group. I also want to thank, seated behind me, is a board member, the support of the Minnesota Board on Aging. There's many great people to acknowledge in this work today. But most importantly, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, for listening to what we have to tell you today. One important uh, agreement we made almost right off the bat is this report would not be done and all this hard work and then put it on a shelf and let it collect dust. 
So we are all here very passionate about making sure that we see action. The Alzheimer's Disease Working Group greatly appreciates the time, effort, and expertise of all committee members who participated in the recommendations and the report development. Our working group also thanks the Minnesota Board on Aging and its staff for handling our group logistics and management analysis and development for meeting facilitation and report writing. Let me spend just a moment to talk about what Alzheimer's and dementia care, what about Alzheimer's and dementia care. Alzheimer's disease is more than just memory loss. It's a progressive disease of the brain that destroys brain cells, causing problems with memory, thinking, and behavior. Dementia is a general term used to describe a decline in cognitive functioning, and Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. There are three stages of Alzheimer's, as you see on the screen. Preclinical, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia due to Alzheimer's. Preclinical. The disease may be present for decades before any symptoms appear. Mild cognitive impairment. Small changes in memory and thinking abilities occur but do not compromise individual independence. And finally, dementia due to Alzheimer's. When Alzheimer's disease and other dementias begin to rob individuals of their abilities, their need for care and acceptance increases. At the same time, the abilities of their for informal network of caregivers are stretched, often adding to the suffering of the individual's family unit. Eventually, families look for various support services that can ease the burden and keep diagnosed individuals safe and otherwise healthy in their own homes. And often the need progresses to the point where residential institutions often become necessary for the sake of everyone involved. I understand that you have a fact sheet from the Alzheimer's Association in your packet for more information. Beth has done such a wonderful job with all of the information today. The facts and statistics on Alzheimer's disease are concerning. However, real life stories bring the crisis to life. Everyone in this room was touched by the stories of the family member previous. The report reflects actual stories from family members and loved ones affected by the disease. We talk about stakeholders I have to commend this group for the amount of good stakeholder input, including families and caregivers. You will hear their voice in our report today. And I thank those members for sharing their personal stories. We were intent on building our recommendations around what really does happen in real life. Their stories provide hope and support for others affected by the disease. They also inspire action by those not directly affected by Alzheimer's disease by personalizing the disease and building awareness around its impact. The bottom line is that Minnesota is still not fully prepared to address the impact of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias on Minnesotans. Many previous efforts to prepare the state while well-intentioned and successful in their own right have been fragmented. Similar to the 2011 working group, the 2018 working group believes Minnesota needs a much stronger and comprehensive statement on Alzheimer's disease. Our working group, and you see the cover of the 2011 report, our working group looked closely at the 2011 report and we are happy to report of the positive action taken. We start with the positive from those initial recommendations. One powerful initiative that emerged from the 2011 Alzheimer's Disease Working Group was Act on Alzheimer's. Maybe some of you have heard of this. A public-private Minnesota-based collaboration. While the original initiative was con has concluded its work, other organizations are continuing Act on Alzheimer's work within communities. 
Also, the legislature responded to that report by providing annual Alzheimer's research grants and a competitive grants program that focuses on dementia and its impact on persons with dementia, family, and friend caregivers of persons with dementia. The Alzheimer's Disease Working Group greatly appreciates the time, effort, and expertise of all community members who participated. So while the state has seen progress, in many ways, some of the 2011 reports suggested areas for improvement and have seen less progress where there's still work needed. Minnesota does not have a coordinated public awareness campaign which leads to gaps in the consistency and clarity of information provided to Minnesota communities. While gold standards for care have been identified, the inconsistent use of these recommendations result in quality of care that varies widely across residential settings. Gaps remain in access to culturally sensitive information and culturally responsive healthcare providers. There are two overarching recommendations as a state we must be clear on who or what agency should be responsible and accountable to these recommendations and monitoring the impact of dementia in Minnesota. And second, we must prioritize and invest in the development of the state's health care workforce. No secret to any of you valued members of the committee. Our working group organized specific recommendations around five stories. Each story relates to a broader area of concern and what we believe the state should do to positively influence those concerns. The five stories are listed here and our next presenters will talk about each one specifically. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you, Ms. Hennon. Um, please identify yourself for the tape. Thanks. Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, I am Dr. Edward Ratner. I'm a physician specializing in geriatric medicine at the University of Minnesota. I also work for the Veterans Administration. And I was privileged to serve on uh, this uh, work group. Uh, the first story uh, I want to uh, describe is a quote from a caregiver who said that the Minnesota legislature needs to realize that there are different types of dementia. An emphasis on person-centered care is also important. Each person deserves to have the most specific individual care plan because we are all unique and special. Minnesota dementia-related data collection is currently minimal, especially compared to many other common diseases such as diabetes and cancer. Since dementia care goes beyond the healthcare system, Data collection needs to include characteristics of geographic and ethnic communities in which people with dementia live. Therefore, the task force recommends that <coughs> dementia care should be part of the state's larger strategic plan for health and aging services. That the state should designate an entity within the state government to continually monitor the state's progress in implementing the working group recommendations to end reliance on intermittent external work groups such as existed in 2011 and 2018. The Departments of Health and Human Services should better coordinate their efforts to improve the quality and availability of dementia-related data. And that the Minnesota Department of Health should obtain data from the Minnesota-based healthcare systems regarding dementia so that that department can help them develop and implement programs and policies that improve care and foster a nurturing, supportive environment for people with dementia and their caregivers. Our vision is that all Minnesotans benefit from a medical care community that is prepared, educated, and supported to diagnose, treat, and care for people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and caregivers. Dementia care requires many professionals besides physicians. Minnesota must promote workforce development in a variety of fields related to aging with the recognition of the need for capacity to, direct, to address cultural and native language diversity. 
As you, I'm sure, know, the vast majority of healthcare professional training occurs in hospitals and clinics. While dementia care occurs primarily in nursing homes, assisted livings, adult day health services, and home health agencies. The task force recommends that the Minnesota legislature should revise Minnesota statutes to remove the exclusion of clinical training at nursing facilities from receiving medical education and research costs, or MERC, grants. <coughs> In addition, the task force recognizes that the Minnesota State Veterans Homes offer an ideal but underutilized setting for training health professionals in dementia care. Therefore, the task force recommends that the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs State Veterans Homes should partner with higher education institutions and other governmental organizations to help create a workforce across many professions that is prepared to provide long-term care services, including dementia care. On to the topic of data, Minnesota collects data on a variety of healthcare issues, but has neglected the common condition of Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, the task force recommends that the state should prioritize and incentivize outcomes reporting on Alzheimer's disease by medical providers. Outcomes that should be reported include, but aren't limited to, the number of screenings and assessments, the number of people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and the number and types of referrals to other resources. Like the current opioid crisis, Alzheimer's disease is going to soon overwhelm existing expertise in the state. Therefore, the task force recommends required training on cognitive impairment through healthcare licensing boards, as is now mandated for physicians related to opioids and social workers related to ethics. Finally, the task force recommends that state agencies and boards responsible for public health, such as the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice, should promote sharing and routine use of the Act on Alzheimer's Practice Guidelines for the detection and management of cognitive impairment and dementia in both primary and specialty care within all Minnesota health systems. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Heidi Haley Franklin and I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Alzheimer's Association. When we think of home, we think home is a place of safety, especially when people feel most vulnerable. Eventually, families look for various support services that can ease the Alzheimer's burden and keep individuals diagnosed safe and otherwise healthy in their homes. But often, the need progresses to the point where residential institutions become necessary for sake of everyone involved. I won't spend significant time on these particular recommendations because instead I want to thank the legislature and the governor for passing the landmark assisted living licensure bill last session which addressed a number of these recommendations. The bill passed last year improved resident rights and established a license framework. While that bill also addressed dementia care standards in the new license framework, it did not address skilled nursing facilities or home care, so we may be back in the future to address those particular settings. One issue in this category that was not a part of the discussion last session is adopt a Minnesota Family and Medical Leave Act that includes parent-in-law in the definition of family members for which an employee can take unpaid leave. Alzheimer's disease is a chronic condition that can last more than a decade. And during each stage, people living with the disease, their family and their caregivers, and medical professionals have unique needs. Addressing expressed concern shows that they have sought and fully heard the voice of the client, patient, and the caregiver. The Minnesota Board on Aging should reevaluate the long-term care counseling process and the information provided through the senior linkage line. They should provide information in more consumer-friendly formats that support patient and family decision-making. The Minnesota Department of Health should reform health systems in Minnesota by promoting early detection and diagnosis of Alzheimer's and other dementias. And they should also incentivize the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias as a chronic disease by keeping an up-to-date authoritative link on its website. 
The state should also actively support creative regional efforts to establish community dementia resource centers that work in partnership with each region's medical community to create a better web of support for each resident needing services. This should include coordination with tribal nations and the American Indian communities. While this disease itself cannot be prevented, Minnesotans impacted by Alzheimer's and other dementias face additional significant and preventable risks, such as financial exploitation and consumer fraud. To protect and keep everyone safe, Minnesota needs to increase awareness of the disease, reduce stigma related to the disease, and develop standards and guidance relating or regarding safety issues, which can help mitigate some of the non-medical risks. However, clear standards and guidelines can help create a safe space within which to have these conversations. And they can allow people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and their caregivers to feel more in control and live independently. As the legislature considers how to mitigate risks, members should consider the needs of families and caregivers who may have different cultural norms and values related to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. The Minnesota legislature su should support a collaboratively led, coordinated, and statewide awareness campaign on Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. This campaign should reduce, help reduce stigma, offer a balanced perspective of risks and treatment possibilities, and share how people adopt to and live well with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's or other dementias. Relevant state agencies should convene a group of dementia experts dementia clinicians, and other pertinent community stakeholders to develop standards around risks and safety related to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and recommend an implementation strategy that could include the dissemination through the Act on Alzheimer's practice guidelines, continuing medical education standards, or other regulatory or statutory changes. This concludes our prepared comments, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Haley Franklin and Mr. Ratner, too, and uh, <laughs> Ms. McMullen also sitting at the table. Thank you for your presentation and all of the work that the working group did. Uh, very, very important. I'm glad you were able to present. Um, Senator Newton, you have a question briefly. Thank We've got two more bills up. Sorry. Uh, a question for Dr. Ratner is uh, when you talk about dementia-capable professionals, uh, who, who are you speaking about? Is that only the, uh, you had neurosurgeons or neuropsychologists, but are these also gerontologists? Are they registered nurses? I, I, uh, thank you Ryan. for the question, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Newton. Uh, the, uh, pretty much everyone other than pediatricians is going to deal with uh, uh, dementia care. And even then, their grandparents uh, caring for their grandchildren and the pediatricians need to be aware of where their cognitive problems. And so the, the issue is not just physicians or neuropsychologists or specialists in this, primary care physicians, uh, nurses, home health aides, the full spectrum and, and within rehabilitation, almost every rehabilitation specialist uh, needs to be able to address uh, the problems of dementia that complicate other uh, diseases. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. One, one quick follow-up, and I, I think Senator Ralph and I are intrigued by this uh, training of health care professionals at state veterans' homes. How, how would you propose doing that? So the, uh, I, we started uh, a project um, with the Minneapolis State Veterans Home uh, in the university that, and, and a course that I uh, coordinate uh, to have medical students uh, go out there, and every medical student uh, to have an opportunity to visit a nursing home, meet a nursing home resident, and uh, and interview and and understand that setting of care, uh, the uh, that state veterans home does have a program with I think two local nursing schools with a small number of nursing students who are coming out there, but it it really just simply requires a a direction and essentially an expansion of the scope of what the veterans homes. Uh, purposes beyond just serving the veterans and and uh, supporting uh, their long-term care needs to saying these are potentially educational institutions that could support our state. So it's a very modest increment, no different than all the hospitals and clinics that accept students um, uh, to 
kind of essentially the legislature to ask this, this, uh, that department to say, can you do something more about that? And then to the extent that they would need some resources or co a collaboration with the universities and, and other schools to make that happen. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was very informative, and you guys have done a lot of work. So thank you. Next up, Senator Ralph, you're going to chair the committee. Senator Housley, I believe you have Senate File 3033 and then Senate File 3281. Uh, yes, I proceed. Do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move Senate File 3033 first. Um, we have just heard from uh, many people today and their stories about taking care of someone um, with Alzheimer's. Uh, what Senate File 3033 does is adds respite care and companion, and companion services to the list of essential community supports provided under Minnesota's essential community supports program. It is that simple. Um, I have with me Josh Nay from the Alzheimer's Association if anybody has any questions. Members, are there any questions? Seeing none. Just Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Abel. I mean, I know we're short of time, but I just have a clarifying question about the whole program. This is for people who are not medical assistance eligible, so it's a way to keep a non, the families that have some means uh, from going into nursing homes. That's the whole big picture of the program, right? Yes, Senator Abler, uh, Mr. Chair, it's intended for persons functionally inelig ineligible for Medicaid, meaning that they don't uh, require the level of care provided by the nursing home facilities, but do require some assistance to remain living at home. No, it's a really good program. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. I think it is, too. Any other questions? Uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, Senator Housley moves Senate File 3033 to pass and be placed on general orders. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to move Senate File 3281. Proceed. Thank you. Um, Senate File 3281 establishes a pilot project to serve victims of elder abuse. Uh, this bill begins to address a critical need in Minnesota by establishing up to four pilot projects that implement a proven safe care shelter system and programming in Minnesota that directly aids victims of elder abuse. While this is a new concept in Minnesota, there are successful models like it throughout the United States. When an older victim of abuse has nowhere to go, shelter can be an effective way to stop abuse and begin the process of healing and recovery. This bill will also create awareness and educate communities on elder abuse and resources available to serve those in need. Uh, I first heard about the Minnesota Sanctuary Services about a year ago when I had the opportunity to meet with Shelley Kendrick, President and CEO of Acumen. Ms. Kendrick. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senate Committee. Um, I'm, I'm honored uh, to be here today. I'm Shelley Kendrick. I'm the CEO of Ecumen. I'm here to share a Minnesota solution for a Minnesota problem. And I also want to thank Senator Housley for supporting and being the chief author of the bill. Thank you. I chose early in my career to work with seniors, and I've been doing it for about 30 years. The astounding fact is that one in 10 seniors are abused. And that is stated through the New England Journal of Medicine. And what by abuse, I mean physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial exploitation, and others. We have greater than 1 million seniors in Minnesota. That means about 100,000 are likely experiencing some kind of el they're an elder abuse victim. Likely one in four cases goes unreported, and seniors then are left in unsafe conditions. 
I've heard these stories personally. I'll give you an example of Ronnie's story. She was a friend of mine in her late 70s with many medical conditions, living on her own. She called me frantically one night, crying, hiding in a closet because her daughter had abused her and beaten her and her daughter, who was in her 30s and addicted to a, an opioid substance. She had beaten her, and she didn't know what to do. I said, call the police. She said, I can't call the police, because then they'll take my daughter to jail. I don't want my daughter to jail, and I don't want anybody to know. She eventually called the ambulance, went to the hospital, got treatment, and then the hospital discharged her home back to her unsafe condition. I didn't have a solution for Ronnie. I haven't had solutions for others who have called me and asked for help. Minnesota Sanctuary Services would be a three-year safety and advocacy pilot, including programs, ser um, programs and services anchored by short-term sh shelters for our elders. The program goals are to create awareness and educate the state of Minnesota on elder abuse and available resources, develop and implement a proven safe care shelter system and programming in Minnesota that directly aids victims of elder abuse. I'm pleased to share that Minnesota Sanctuary Service is modeled on a proven national model that has been in place for 15 years. The Weinberg Center for Elder Justice, it's the nation's first comprehensive shelter for victims of elder abuse. Through a partnership, they've established now 13, in 13 states, different sites to help elders. Minnesota Sanctuary Services requires collaborative partners in Minnesota to bring this proven solution home to here to Minnesota. Consider the importance of this short-term shelter, a safe haven for elders in abusive situations, the ability to move these victims into safe environments and surround them with the support of caring partners and services with the objective of resolving the situation and moving them back to their homes. The goal of our pilot with our esteemed partners will prove viability for this solution for Minnesota so it can be replicated across the state. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today, Mr. Chairman and committee members, as well as uh, Senator Housley. <laughs> thank you, Shelley. She's my constituent. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. If I may, my name is Brett Anderson, committee members, and I'm an RN and the chief operating officer at Ecumen. As an RN, I've spent my entire career serving seniors and have seen the need for this pilot program firsthand and unfortunately far too many times. With this robust program, we've identified four possible regional short-term shelter locations and program service hubs that can serve a large radius of the entire state allowing us to reach the entire state to serve all Minnesotans. We would designate a qualified program manager who would oversee the program. At each site, a project coordinator and social worker would manage the Minnesota Sanctuary Services within their designated region. When notified by a referral source, we would begin a coordinated care response to determine the needs of that abused elder. This might include direct program support services to admittance into one of our four regional short-term shelter locations. Based on the national model we hope to replicate, the average stay in those shelters is approximately 60 days. As this is a pilot, we also know that data outcomes and evaluation is critically important. As this is a Minnesota problem, we know we need partnerships and collaboration with other leading organizations in Minnesota. In partnership with Wilder Research, we would conduct planning, market research, and an awareness campaign. We also plan to leverage Wilder's deep research expertise to measure and evaluate the following outcomes. The demographics of the individuals served, the number of referrals, and the source of those referrals. Perpetrator to the victim and their relationship, 
the type of abuse perpetrated, the number of shelter referrals and sources, the number of shelter admissions, the number of program referrals and sources of those referrals, the number of individuals receiving services, and the training impact, statewide training impact of training all of our direct caregivers and partner agencies and law enforcement and hospital into the program, and the impact of the awareness campaign. The impact Minnesota Sanctuary Services can have on Minnesota seniors can make a significant impact on that alarming statistic of one in 10 elders being victims of abuse. We can create further awareness of this problem and provide a collaborative solution to bring quality of life back to those that are impacted. I'd like to call attention to two letters of support in your packet. The first is from Leading Age Minnesota CEO, Gail Kvenvold. The second is from the Minnesota Hospital Association CEO, Dr. Rahul Karani. The hospital association support is so critical as so many abused elders end up in the emergency room, as Shelley alluded to, waiting for services that don't exist or aren't readily available. And unfortunately, too many times, they end up going right back to the problem. Our pilot program can fill this critical need and divert many of our abused elders to our sanctuary services. So lastly, in, in closing, I too wanted to share an experience of a family member of an abused elder. And as I solicited stories from individuals we knew, the response was obviously heart-wrenching. But I wanted to take a moment to share a very recent and all too frequent experience one of our team members shared and reported to us, which we had to refer to law enforcement. And in this story, it's not a story from a family member who we reached out to, but unfortunately, it is sharing the voice of someone who was silent, unable to speak for themselves, and for the rest of those stricken in, in silence to share those, their story. A daughter falsified her mother's power of attorney documents to manipulate, exploit, and neglect her mother while lying to her remaining family members out of state about her mother's condition and the care being provided. She stopped filling her mother's prescriptions, who had dementia, convinced her the medication was poison, and diverted those funds for those medications into her own pocket. As her mother declined, she failed to get the care she needed in the home and took what remaining little money and possessions her mother had left for herself. When we got a call from an out-of-state son to see how we could help, it was another reminder of the progress that we all need to make to serve our seniors and how much this mother needed help. Mr. Chair and members, I know we can collectively as a state do better, and Ecumen is committed to being a part of this solution to this problem. Thank you for your time and listening to our proposed solution today. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, you have, uh, Senator Housley, you do have one more testifier, I believe? Um, yes, I have Mr. Burke. Um, while Mr. Burke's, Burke's coming up here, I do have an amendment. Um, I move to Senate File 3281 on page 2, line 4. It's just an oral amendment. Um, strike January and insert March. Senator Housley moves to amend uh, Senate File 3281 uh, as follows on line 2.4, strike the word January and insert the word March. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Burke. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Sean Burke. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. We're a statewide organization serving older Minnesotans and their families who have been victimized, abused, neglected, financially exploited. We thank Senator Housley and Ecumen and the other stakeholders for bringing forward this important idea for Minnesota. Older and vulnerable adult abuse is primarily perpetrated by family members. Some estimates of upwards of 70% of perpetrators are grandchildren, adult children, and spouses. It's a sad reality that much of elder abuse is domestic violence. And these are complex cases, often with co-occurring types of abuse, financial exploitation, emotional abuse, manipulation, physical abuse. Sometimes an individual needs shelter. Sometimes they need in-home services. Sometimes they just need the abuse to stop 
but don't want that loved one to go to jail. Consider these examples of daily calls into our office. A woman in her 80s with an adult grandson. He has chemical dependency. He's causing a great deal of stress in the house, but he won't leave. Or an adult child moves in, promises to care for the aging dad, but soon the siblings find that money's disappearing and dad is not going to his appointments. Or an intensive case manager working with older adults, they're neglecting their own care needs and they're on the verge of homelessness. They've called adult protection, but adult protection is too busy or can't address the case. For decades in Minnesota, we've relied on Adult Protective Services, a county-based system to protect vulnerable adults in these and other situations. But these are after-the-fact responses, and they're not always adequate. We need more strategies, prevention strategies. We need to be working upstream, and therefore, we are excited about this pilot project. This bill would fund four different programs throughout the state. It's a great way to test how to create a robust sanctuary program. We do have a few ideas to improve the underlying policy, and we look forward to continue to working with the author, such as streamlining the statewide campaign component in the bill, directly encouraging partnerships with domestic advocacy organizations who are already serving older and vulnerable adults in their systems and shelters, and to allow services to be, be provided wherever the adult may reside, as sometimes victims of abuse are best served in their own homes. Again, we are so appreciative uh, for this bill, and we look forward to working on it and improving the situation for vulnerable and older adults in our state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Anything further, Senator Housley? No, I want to thank um, all of the testifiers and uh, for, for your work on this. And I would like to move um, Senate File 3281 as amended to the Committee on Human Services Reform. Uh, are there any questions from the members before we uh, no, entertain? <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Curran. Mr. Chair, Senator Housley, appreciate the, this bill as well. And, and as we've met in the past up in North Branch as well, and thank you, Ms. Kendrick. But, and, and so I think it's really good because we do so many things for our out-of-home placement and safety nets and all those things for our children. But we have missed this big piece on the elder side and it happens on an everyday basis. And as the testifier said, it's mostly family, not just in physical abuse, but the housing and the dependency. We have multi-generational housing in many cases for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> and I think the scenarios here highlight those. We need to focus with our education awareness. Everything we've talked about is multi-generational housing for all the right reasons and to prepare our caregivers you know, for their own end of life mortality um, so they can better prepare for those family members or be aware of what's going on to make sure their family members are, are extremely well taken care of. It really fits well. Senator Housley and I both serve on, on the Commerce Committee and we've done a lot there for the financial crimes and to give immunity to people that have um, that from a financial exploitation perspective. Is there an element here that we have to explore? Do we need to increase or make sure the protections of immunity are in place for all of those reporters that would be out there today? Because we're, you know this is a this is a going to be a those that turn people in in a mandatory reporting environment. Um, this will provide the vehicle now that they have somewhere to go. But I can imagine the outlash when you're taking away somebody's livelihood, those that are dependent or are living off of that elder that they're abusing. So I'm just curious if that's something we need to explore further. So. Mr. Chair and Senator Coran, um, that, that's a good point, And I think we should explore it going forward. So let's have that discussion um, to see what we could do to fix that. Thanks. Thank you. Being no further, Senator Housley renews her motion uh, to uh, recommend to pass and be referred to the Committee on Human Services Reform and Policy and Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, Mr. Chair, I have one more thing. Uh, members, we've been informed by the Department of Human Services that the previous bill, Senate File 3033, has a fiscal impact. Um, I move that we reconsider the vote by which SF3033 was passed and sent to general orders. Senator Housley moves Senate File 3033 be recommended to pass, oh, I'm sorry, uh, to reconsider the vote uh, by which uh, Senate 3033 was passed and sent to general orders. Uh, in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
And then I move to uh, that Senate File 3033 be recommended to pass and referred to Committee on Human Services Reform. Senator Housley moves that the Senate File 3033 be recommended to pass and sent to the Human Services Committee of Finance and Ref uh, sorry, Reform, Finance and Policy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion Thank you, carries. Mr. Chair and members. And we do not have a committee hearing next Wednesday. We have one on Wednesday, March 4th at 8.30. Thanks. There being no further business, committee is adjourned.